Hello, good afternoon from Westminster. Prime Minister's Questions is about to get underway. Our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, is here with me now. Just the second PMQs officially as, as leader for Kemi Badenoch, Sam. Uh, last week's PMQ slightly overshadowed uh, by the election in America and the fact that Donald Trump had just been declared the winner. It's a really important Prime Minister's Questions thing because this is the first time that we're going to see properly how Kemi Badenoch approaches it. This is the first where, as you say, we, we went sort of two hours after President uh, Trump-elect being announced as the uh, next President of the United States. Uh, he used, she used that last week uh, as the vehicle that, you know, to, to, to cross-question Keir Starmer uh, about um, past comments by him and uh, his foreign secretary. Uh, but this is where she can pick the agenda. She is the, uh, the politician who will be able to set the conversation in the Prime Minister's questions that we're about uh, to hear. So I'm fascinated to see what she goes on and how she goes on it. Keir Starmer, of course, uh, landed from Baku in Azerbaijan uh, at about 8.30 last night. I was travelling in uh, with him. Uh, we arrived in North London just... Uh, and he'll have got back to Downing Street at 10pm. So he may be a little, uh, a little tired. Two days of uh, cemetery uh, now giving way to Prime Minister's questions. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on Monday I was honoured to join President Macron to mark Armistice Day in Paris and together we paid tribute to the fallen of the First World War and all subsequent conflicts who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we enjoy today. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I also attended the COP summit. My focus, as ever, was on British energy security and the jobs of the future that should be with these shores, central issues of concern to people in this country. It is also Islamophobia Awareness Month, and I reaffirm our commitment to standing against discrimination and racism in all its forms. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Christine Jolly. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In the two weeks since the budget, I've been contacted by several GP practices in my constituency of Edinburgh West, including my own, I should say, with their genuine fears that the impact of the changes to national insurance employers' yeah. contribution yeah. will threaten their ability to continue to offer the public the health service at the standard they do at the moment. And they are far from the only ones struggling, particularly in the health and social care sectors. So can the Prime Minister tell me, or perhaps he and his Chancellor would like to come to my constituency and explain to those GPs, to charities and others, how they are meant to cope without extra support from the government? Look, Mr Speaker, what I would say is this. Because of the tough decisions that we took, we have put forward a budget with an extra, Mr Speaker, an extra £25.6 billion for the NHS and for social care. That includes an increase to carers' allowance um, and £600 million available to deal with the pressures of adult social care. We will ensure that GP practices have the resources that we need and the funding arrangements between the NHS and contractors will be set out in the usual way. Lord David, Lord Hutton. Mr Speaker. Members have raised their concerns with a range of damaging policies pursued by the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. This includes voting against critical investment for our NHS, stating that maternity pay is excessive yeah. and the minimum wage a burden, yeah. and yeah. even backing harmful fracking when last in government. Yeah. So is the Prime Minister aware of any attempt by the Leader of the Opposition to justify these dangerous positions which would cause untold damage to communities like mine in South Dorset? This government has given millions of people a pay rise of £1,400 by boosting the minimum wage. We strengthen parental leave with better rights for parents, got huge investment into our schools and NHS, and all of that whilst ensuring that pay slips of working people have not been affected. It's clear whose side we're on, the working people of this country. Uh, now, I haven't heard the Leader of the Opposition clarify why she opposes all these things, uh, but now is her chance. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Kemi Bernal. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister can plant as many questions as his yeah. life with his backbenchers. But at the end of the day, I'm the one he has to face at the dispatch box. And I welcome him, Mr Speaker. I welcome him back from... Mr Speaker, I welcome the Prime Minister back from his trip to Azerbaijan, where he has unilaterally made commitments that will make life more experienced for everyone back home. Speaking of making life... Somebody's suggesting reading. I think if you notice, the Prime Minister also reads. So please get your... And, Mr Speaker, I can pre-prepare my questions, but he needs to answer from his mind. Speaking of making life... Responsible for the answers. So he has made life more expensive with his unilateral commitments, but speaking of making life more expensive, will the Prime Minister confirm that he will keep the cap on council tax? Mr Speaker, she talks of the trip to COP. I'm very proud... I'm very proud of the fact that we're restoring leadership on climate yeah. to this country the UK. Because that will be measured in lower bills on energy independence and the jobs of the future. And, in relation, and, and she may have missed, but on Monday I was very pleased to announce a huge order into jobs in Hull for blades for offshore wind. If she's opposed to that sort of action, she should go to Hull and say so. On the, on the question of council, she knows what the arrangements are. I think the House would have heard that the Prime Minister could neither confirm nor deny whether there was a cap in council tax was being raised. So I will ask him this question. How much extra does he expect local authorities will have to raise to cover the social care funding gap created by the Chancellor's budget and increases in employers' NI? He told, he told the member for Edinburgh West just now that he was covering uh, social care. How much extra does he expect local authorities to raise? It's all very well, uh, this knockabout, but not actually listening to what I said three minutes ago. There's a bit of a fundamental failure of the leader of the opposition. I just said £600 million. I repeat it, £600 million. That he has repeated that number because he has probably not listened to the Labour run LGA who said that with no separate funding for the Chancellor's budget announcements, care providers will likely see increased costs which will cost councils more and all of the £600 in grant increase he is giving will not cover what is required for adult social care. It is clear that they had not thought through the impact of the budget and this is the problem with having a copy and paste Chancellor. Did they not realise that care homes... Did they not realise care homes, GP surgeries, children's nurseries, hospices and even charities have to play employers' NI? We have put more money into local authorities than they did in 14 years. In an absolutely catastrophic state. We produced a budget which does not increase tax on working people, nothing in the payslip. Investing in our NHS, investing in our schools so every child can go as far as their talent will take them, investing in the houses of the future. If she's against those things, she should say so. Mr Speaker, I'm not against any of those things. But Of course not. None of us are against any of those things. But he has confirmed that he does not know what is going on. The Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister probably does not realise that on Monday, the Ministry for Communities, Local Government and Housing revealed that councils will need to find an additional £2.4 billion in council tax next year. That's a lot more than £600 million. I know that he's been away, but did the Deputy Prime Minister, who runs that department, make him aware of their £2.4 billion black hole? So let me get this straight, Mr Speaker. She doesn't want any of the measures in the budget, but she wants all the benefits. So the magic mandatory is back after two weeks in office. Two weeks in office. They've learned absolutely nothing. We've put forward a budget which takes the difficult decisions, fixing the £22 billion black hole that they left investing in the future of our country. They say they want all of that, but they don't know how they're going to pay for it. Same old Tories. 
Mr. Speaker, even, even he has to admit that they fiddled the fiscal rules. The OBR has actually said that they don't recognise where the additional growth is going to come from. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, the fact is the rise in employers' national insurance for, is going to be a disaster for small businesses around the country. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you about Kelly. For over 20 years, Kelly has run an after-school club business supporting 500 children and families in her borough. In 2024, her national insurance cost was about £10,000. In April, this will rise to £26,000. That is a 150% increase in costs from the budget alone. What is the Prime Minister's message to Kelly and the 500 families her small business supports if it goes under? I would say this to Kelly. We inherited a very badly damaged... We inherited a £22 billion black hole, and we were not prepared to continue with the fiction. We stabilised... Oh. Ms Lopez, I'm sure I couldn't expect better from you as a PPS as well. Prime Minister. I would say to Kelly, we are fixing the mess that we were left. We're investing in the future of our country. I would also say to her that the Leader of the Opposition, week two, wants all the benefits from the budget, but has no way of saying how she's going to pay for it. Same old mistake over and over again. Yeah. Mr Speaker, he has nothing to offer except platitudes. And the fact is that they do not know what they're doing. Their ideological budget was designed to milk the private sector and hope nobody would notice. Now his cabinet ministers are all queuing up for public sector bailouts to his tax mess. If he is going to bail out the public sector, then can he tell us this? Does he think it is appropriate, as the Ministry for Housing has done, to approve a four-day week for councils that is not flexible working, but is actually part-time work for full-time pay? Yeah. Questions based on what we're actually doing are usually better than fantasy questions made up. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, um, what did they deliver in 14 years? Low growth, low growth, stagnant economy, a disastrous mini budget, a £22 billion pack hole. And, and now she wants to give me advice on running the economy. I, I don't want to be rude, but no, thank you very much. 